Hello, this is Lady Tehila from the Coven of the Open Mind, and you're watching Wicca and Witchcraft 101. Hail and welcome. This is uh, lecture 16, and today we are finally talking about modern witchcraft. We're going to start where we left off in the early modern era, talking about the witch hunt era, which many call the burning times, though it's a bit of a misnomer, so we'll talk about that. Uh, what drove that witch hunt era? Uh, we're going to bust some myths uh, that are very popular about that era. We'll also talk about how the hunt eventually ended and led into the modern age, the late modern age, uh, and the occult timeline that brought us Wicca <laughs> as a religion. So before we start with the witch hunt era, uh, I do want to put a trigger warning <laughs> on the subject. Um, it's, I know it's, to some it may seem a little silly, especially because of our culture of being very open and, and tackling issues directly and, and discussing difficult topics um, in our own uh, community, which if you haven't joined and you're interested in the way we do things, you should join. Um, but yeah, so the witch hunt era was a time of fear and dread and horrible things were said to have happened and horrible things did happen. Um, if you want to, I will put uh, what time stamp to skip ahead to uh, in the description. <laughs> you can skip to the late modern age when we start talking about Wicca instead if you're not interested. But, um, but the witch hunt era was a major part of history um, for Wicca and witchcraft in general. And that's why uh, we do talk about it in depth and go into it um, and also uh, correct a lot of... Um, incorrect facts that people hold about that era because it was so romanticized and um, and not a lot of actual historical research was done on it until more recently. So, um, you know, yeah, so I I've cited uh, the work of an author whose research is very extensive. And if you're interested in the witch hunt era, then I suggest that you buy a copy of, of that book as well. And, and all the data and a lot of the information from this section is taken from there. So um, that book is phenomenal. Let me see if I have it on my shelf. Yes, I keep this in my history shelf, not my religious studies. Um, this is a real historical book. I'll flip this image so you can read it. Quite good. It's very long. Do you see this? Um, it's, re it's a real it's a real like history textbook in a way of, of the age. I know it looks small for a textbook, but it's, it, it is that comprehensive and difficult to read. Um, and it's the kind of thing you would read like in college courses if you studied the era. So I have read it <laughs> and summarized the important parts and cited it all in my book and pulled some of the data from there. But I definitely recommend that people buy and read and use this as a reference um, because that's where I get most of my facts about the witch hunt era from as well as a few other sources, so all of that cited in my book. Okay, so the witch hunt era, the early modern period, we're talking about the end of the medieval period. So this is sometime during the 1300s. We see that uh, Satan is no longer the enemy as in the pagan god, um, but the enemy as in the cosmic being that is the antithesis of God and all things holy. So uh, witches are now going to be seen as being diabolical. They're going to be seen as working with this transcendent force that is Satan, that is the enemy, the opposite of God, right? So this is the time when you start to see the cosmic battle um, from Zoroastrianism has fully permeated Christian thought. And there is a revitalization going within the Christian philosophy. Uh, as a result of, of you know, being in a, a region that's constantly ruled by one group or another, it, it's religiously very tumultuous. So you see uh, people shift away from believing, I have to rely on this political entity that is a church for my salvation. And the idea of, I want to be empowered for my own salvation, I want to know that it's within my control because I don't know who's going to be running the show in the next couple decades. That is how tumultuous a region it was and how um, the religious, you know, it, it was very mixed 
from one group to the next, from one decade to the next. And that's why it was very easy to see a shift between trusting an external authority and trusting oneself to do what is right. So we see Dante, <laughs> Dante Alieri, his Dante's Inferno comes out. We see the rise of the Ten Commandments and the decline of the seven deadly sins, right? So the idea that you should avoid certain things if you want to be holy versus you are commanded to obey certain things if you are to be holy. And the standard for morality shifted as well as the perception of hell, of what awaited, of the punishment that awaited for people that couldn't do as they were commanded, right? Um, and people felt personally responsible for their role in the cosmic battle. They felt like every action that anybody took was meaningful. So they, there was like a profound belief in magic as we see it today. So that's the other factor. I want to take a minute and define some terms here. So diabolism means consorting with the devil. <laughs> that's what it means. Maleficia are acts of dark magic, things that are intended to cause harm. And um, at first, it was like these were bad things that people could choose to do, whether they did magic or not. But in time, and we'll talk about the, the, the exact nature of that timeline and how propaganda largely drove this shift, but witches were eventually believed uh, that they necessarily made pacts with the devil in order to obtain their powers or maintain their youth. Um, and usually those powers were seen to be powers that they used over men. So, um, one thing that also happened, um, that we'll talk about is the publication of standard documentation that espoused all of this additional stuff as well. Um, and that is where you see the claims of witches flying to the air on uh, broomsticks or seducing men into premarital sex. And like, that's what witches did, right? So the notion that that's what witches did uh, really came from like fear of women um, and fear of the power of womanhood um, and of the tempting nature of women because now everyone is responsible for their own salvation, right? Um, so th this, at this time, the, it was seen as a perversion of Catholicism, right? So um, if you were diabolical, then you were performing the black mass. You were doing um, the opposite of the Catholic mass. So the middle of the night and, uh, I don't know, you speak backwards or uh, you do other disconcerting things that go against the teachings of Christ, um, you harm each other or, you know, whatever the case may be. But it, at this point, it wasn't like deranged. <laughs> it was, um, it was more just like, um, people that are diabolical are not Christian, they're, they're not Catholic. Um, and, and they're um, purposefully disobeying they, they're supporting the enemy. They're supporting the cosmic enemy, Satan. Um, and that's how Zoroastrianism and Christianity merged. That's sort of like the, um, the crux of that combination, right? So, th so this is when we see the rise of um, what will become the Protestant Revolution, which we'll talk about. So uh, before we get to the religious philosophy stuff a little bit more detailed, um, I wanted to give you some actual dates, right? So we have 1324, uh, Dame Quetelier in France. Uh, I believe it's France. It might have been Germany, and, but she was French. She was an aristocrat, and she was tried for maleficia. She was tried for murder and summoning demons to murder people. <laughs> so she was tried. She had a bunch of associates. She fled the country, and her associates hung for her. Um, and that was the first time in legal record where someone was tried for the act of maleficia. However, it was a ecclesiastic church, uh, ecclesiastic court. It was owned by the church. So uh, it, technically the crime is hearsay. The crime is 
knowing that God exists and choosing not to believe in him. Okay, and it becomes blasphemy when you tell others that information. So those are the definitions of hearsay. So she was tried for hearsay. So, so that was not technically witchcraft, okay? In 1397, uh, Stedelin, who was probably a Druid or some remnant of an older religion, uh, was caught doing magic in the act, and he was a peasant, and he was tried in a secular court, um, and his crime was actually magic. It was the secular crime of magic. So he was technically the first witch to die in the witch hunt era. Uh, and that is in 1397. Okay, so you have uh, the Spanish Inquisition that starts in the middle of the 1400s. So that's pretty early on in the witch hunt era. Uh, Spain basically is really uh, just declaring Islam and Judaism illegal. It's not really about witches. It's really about um, it's really about all religious practice that is not Hispanic uh, Catholicism. And, um, and they also were some of the most superstitious, however. So um, a lot of like the stories that formed into the Malleus Maleficarum, which is like the propaganda, we'll talk about some more in a second, um, came from this region. So they had the most fear of witches, which is why when they did convict a person of witchcraft, it was usually a live burning. And it happened very infrequently because they gave almost everyone the chance to repent. It was still, it was about religious persecution, it was about intolerance, but it was still um, very rational. And it was really just about bringing a more uniform region together that fought less amongst themselves so that it could be more successful. Like that, it's really just in the region of Gaul, people were done with clans and sects and, um, and religious heterogeneity, <laughs> they wanted homogeneity, they wanted it to be, um, you know, so that that's where the driving factor, but that's one of the first countries that did just declare war against other religions, and it did kind of set the tone and pave the way uh, for the Holy Roman Empire to do the same. <clears throat> so um, crime at this time was rampant all over Europe, like I said, remnant of shifting powers, constantly changing laws that nobody could keep track of or respect. <laughs> um, people were afraid of crime. They were afraid uh, that their church would lose power. It was a time where religion was a vehicle for control over the masses, for control in general and in society. So this is where you see the corruption of the teachings of Christ, by the way, also, side note. <laughs> but um, because of this time of the world, people started to translate it so that it would appear to mean one thing or another. Okay, so that sort of thing. And and the Protestants were translating the book into every language. They, they no longer wanted people reading in Latin, they wanted people reading in their own language and having their own understanding of it. So there's a lot of reasons why <laughs> um, the Bible started to be mistranslated. Okay, the largest driving factor, <clears throat> the largest factor that led to the ability of these nations to hunt witches in mass uh, in an inquisitorial style were changes to the legal system, right? The shift from the ecclesiastic courts to the secular courts. Okay, so now you have judges presiding, you have government bodies uh, running the investigation. So in the past, it was accusatorial. So you accused somebody of a crime, and then you had to gather evidence of them having committed that crime. If you couldn't gather enough evidence, then they were not going to be convicted. But you're not allowed to go into a person's house and search. You're not allowed. You're still not allowed to break the laws to get that evidence. So that's why um, when they shifted to the inquisitorial style, they had more resources. So if someone said, this person's doing magic, they're like, well, prove it. They can't do that. When they shifted to the inquisitorial style, now there are government representatives whose job it is to collect the evidence. And it, at the beginning, it required two eyewitnesses um, or a confession or, or both. So, you know, confessions were not forthcoming. 
and having eyewitnesses to mental crimes like hearsay is impossible. So if someone's doing hearsay, then how would you even know that they're consorting with the devil in their dreams? How would you know? So they concluded the only rational thing to do would be to torture people to try to get confessions out of them. So as you can surmise, that was not um, a wise thing to believe. We'll talk about that um, and the psychology of that. But note that at this time, ordeals were no longer common, like the does she weigh as much as a duck kind of thing was very medieval. There were not a lot of witch hunts during the medieval period. There were some. It varies from region to region. Um, but it was just only for people doing dark magic that are obviously hurting people or they're cursing people in the street. Um, it was not irrational, really. Uh, and medieval witchcraft was constantly in flux and changing and evolving. So a lot of times it would just be like, well, I don't like her way of doing magic. She's different. She's new or something. I, um, it'd be like a midwife would lose a few newborns because there's some disease going around that she doesn't know about, but everyone would blame her and then they'd do an ordeal to see if she's a witch. So that did happen, but it was not widespread. It was not like a major thing, you know? So that's why when people think of the witch hunt era, they often think of that and like that sketch from Monty Python, but that's not like what we're talking about in the witch hunt era, which was a much darker time really even than that. So um, the other thing that they were no longer allowed to use was infamia, infamia, that you can't um, just point out that people don't like someone and be like, see, nobody trusts him. So obviously he did it. <laughs> That's not a good enough reason to, uh, to, to um, hang people uh, anymore. So those are the changes <clears throat> that began to occur in all these various regions and finished occurring between the 13th and 1400s some, sometime. And it allowed for the persecution to be government sanctioned. It allowed for it to be susceptible to interference from propaganda and uh, you know, religious bodies trying to control government bodies. Um, a lot of the fear had to do with um, other sects that were not strictly Christian, like the Cathas and the, Wald the Waldensians. They were um, largely agnostic revival movements and they were very popular. Uh, and they're spreading like wildfire because they were not as strict as Christianity, even though they largely agreed about wanting to serve uh, an all conscious being and wanting to serve goodness and not consorting with demons. They were compatible philosophies, but they were growing in power. And that was a good enough reason to just, you know, eliminate them. So um, they got pushed out of the region or were eliminated in time. Um, and this sort of, vehicleization of religion uh, is what led to the propaganda that then drove the actual witch hunt era to come. Okay, so now we'll talk about the Protestant Reformation specifically. Um, that's the religious shift in reasoning that I mentioned. Um, and it was started by Martin Luther and Jean Calvin. They wanted to restore Christianity to its early Christian purity. <laughs> <laughs> whatever that means, really. But they authored new masses, and, uh, and they translated all of the religious texts from Latin into all the various languages that were spoken in the region. <clears throat> People saw the devil as being more important in daily life. Um, it, it was a temptation to do non-pious acts, so the devil became less of a figure and more of an idea. Um, it became seen as like the internal will over time as well. Um, it started with this ideology shift and ended with the Hermeticists, so we'll come back to that. But the idea of inner divinity being aligned with Satan is something that um, has taken a long journey also. <laughs> but um, they began to preach fire and brimstone. So they began to preach hell as a punishment and heaven as a reward. Um, they started to take the Bible literally, even where it's mistranslated, and they were translating it into all these languages. <laughs> so you can see why people began to believe that thou shalt not suffer a witch to live means burn any person I suspect of magic at the stake or I'm going to burn in hell, right? So that it was not 
people being irrational individually. So we'll come back to that. Um, any rejection of the Bible was seen as idol worship and therefore consorting with Satan, so therefore diabolism. Okay, Any rejection of the Bible is devil worship. That is what they put forth with the Protestant Reformation. So people were living in constant fear that they were not going to be good enough to get into heaven. They, they constantly were wondering if they were righteous enough and it gave the power of salvation back to man, back to individuals, and away from the Catholic leadership. So the Catholics hated it. <laughs> the Catholics were like, oh, oh no. And in the regions where Catholicism and Protestantism coexisted, the fear was the greatest of all. And it was spurred by uh, propaganda from the religious leadership. <clears throat> So there were political motives behind the witch hunts and the witches sort of became the boogeyman, right? The witches, they were designed to make people live in fear, to make people turn to their church for salvation because they, it's up to them to know what's right and what's wrong, but they can't tell. They can't always tell. So they better turn to their local church. So, um, what people saw as diabolism, remember before it was just an inversion of the Catholic mass. It was like still pretty innocent. They still believed that um, demons would not do homoerotic acts or um, because they were still angels in a way. Uh, so they didn't, so they didn't have the same idea of what evil would mean, what it would mean to really invert goodness or invert, Right. So after the Protestant Reformation, now people are believing that the antithesis of Christian teachings are deranged things. Right. So um, nobody led a purely pious life. Nobody was purely pious. Everybody was tempted. Uh, they said you're not allowed to be tempted. How do they control that? Right. So they're they're being forced into a strictness they can't adhere to. Um, so they want to believe, however, that they're not guilty of the crime of diabolism. They want to believe that they're going to go to heaven, even though they feel evil on the inside and they're being made to feel evil on the inside. <clears throat> so the things that they saw as being diabolical <laughs> went from like speaking the Catholic mass backwards <laughs> and celebrating at midnight to um like horrible things okay uh cannibalistic uh things um infanticide um and then you know like homosexuality was demonized alongside this so you know homosexuality and eroticism and promiscuity um was seen they would see the witches as da as dancing naked in the moonlight um, at these black mass gatherings and eating babies and crazy stuff that obviously never happened. And, and they were supposedly flying on their brooms to get there. So that is probably a reference to flying ointment, which they would use um, with the, end, the ends of the brooms that, as a way of like masturbating to get into an altered state of mind where they could do magical acts. So it, the flying ointment is hallucinogenic a little in part. So, you know, they would have these visions and things that are not grounded in actual reality, but everyone was convinced that these witches were physically doing these things and, um, and they were terrified of what witches could do. So, um, so that is where the fear comes from. It was really just whatever society considered to be the, the stuff of complete, absolute, um, just nightmares. Just th that's how they, so that is where the demonization of witchcraft comes from. Um, it is the boogeyman so that they can feel like they're living a pious enough life by not eating babies or flying to a black mess. I don't know, it's strange. Okay, so that's the Protestant Reformation. And I wanted to just 
take a moment and look at this imagery on the slide for the scope of the witch hunt so that people can get it in their mind like exactly what are we talking about like you hear it in that song the burning times right so uh when <clears throat> what how does it you know nine million european women died that's not factual that did not happen um i'm not even sure if nine million people lived in europe uh at any given time, but this is, uh, you know, a 350 year period of history. It spans uh, all of Europe and the Americas, um, and, and, it, and it is completely different in every region. <clears throat> Both the nature of the trials, the nature of the courts, uh, the nature of uh, the level of hysteria, the response to these things. In large cities, it was different than small cities, but you know, in general, uh, by region, you can see in the chart, you know, where the most leniency was shown in Spain, for instance, that's where they had live burnings um, because burning people alive is expensive. So they couldn't. Um, the Holy Roman Empire, right? So that's where Germany is now. It was broken into smaller regions. There's a different graphic in my book, or you can just look it up. But um, the Bavarian uh, time period, you see a bunch of different kingdoms and they came together to form the Holy Roman Empire. And that is where the worst of it happened because of the blending with, between Protestantism and Catholicism is very hetero, heterogeneous, heterogeneous. And it also had a lot of um, resistance to learning uh, Latin in the first place, uh, especially in France. Um, uh, as well, so that so you see the regions that were the ones to reject the Roman Empire the most. It seems to me are also the ones that had you know the most diversity of Christian philosophies and other types of fears, superstitions, um, and it was a time where whatever church you had faith in, like was the government also. So you're trusting them with your livelihood. You're trusting them to protect you. Um, so yeah, so so it was. There's a lot of cultural um, differences between that time period in history and this one, where we have such a profound separation between church and state, and that is not how things used to be. And I think people don't. I think it's worth it to um, to note that in the places where there was the most disagreement between what the religions were, what, what the truth was, and then you see also um, the most fear, right? And that's why you see the number of deaths is higher. So that's an interesting, and, and that's the scope of the witch hunt. We'll talk about the numbers in a second, but <clears throat> really it was more like um, 90,000 people were convicted over, or were, um, were tried overall. Uh, and that does not include like little in little villages, but about 90,000 were tried overall and about half of that were convicted and most of them in Germany and France <laughs> and the remnants of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, so I want to take a minute and do some myth busting um, because again, Gardner writes about this and gets it wrong. <laughs> um, I think Doreen Valiant writes about this and quotes Gardner. I think most people write about this and quote Gardner because he was an anthropologist, so he did study and read a lot, but the standard for historical works back then was not very high. So they get most of their knowledge from Margaret Murray, who we'll talk about in a second, and she was not a historian. She was not a very good historian. She, well, she wrote about stuff that wasn't her expertise, uh, and, and there was just not good standards back then. So today, now, we're looking at actual records and actual historical evidence, and it's all cited and well-documented. <clears throat> and we know some things that, you know, maybe pop culture gets wrong. And I think the most common belief is that most people were burned at the stake alive and they will have past life visions of that having happened to them. I think that's a romanticization. Most people were hung. Uh, it was just cheaper to hang people. And then um, they were burnt en masse because they did believe that they had to destroy the body before the demon the devil would be set free or whatever like the, there was some religious but they did it in mass graves usually they didn't bury the ashes 
there were no graves and that's what made it cheaper because they could just do it in a mass cremation. Um, live burnings did occur in Spain that had the fewest convictions. Like we talked about, usually live burnings were more common for wealthier people in society um, because um, people were more interested in watching them die. <laughs> that's really why. Um, okay, myth busting. The myth is that women lived in constant fear of being accused of witchcraft. And to some extent, they were afraid of that, especially midwives or people that were in a position that they could easily be blamed as a scapegoat so that the lady of the house doesn't have to admit she's infertile or had an abortion or something. But um, most of the people were afraid of the witches themselves. Most people were actually just afraid of witches. So it was a time of fear because everyone was afraid of witches. <laughs> Uh, the belief that 9 million witches died and it was like a holocaust for witches is not factual. That's very romanticized. It's unlikely that there are any witches meeting in mass. It's unlikely any of them would have killed themselves in mass to get away. The, the whole burning time song is just a fun romanticization, I guess. It's not fun. It's the opposite of fun. So I don't, it's a nice song. I, I like the first verse or two or the last one, but it doesn't get the history right. It needs to be corrected. Um, closer to 45,000 people died total. Most of them were probably not witches. <laughs> Most of them were probably just people. Um, and they didn't really have a very good way to discern who's doing magic or what kind of magic they're doing. So that was another reason why they couldn't get a handle on it. Um, the myth is that it was a time of mass hysteria where individuals were irrational. And in reality, the experts were greatly over-exaggerating the number of witches and the threat to society. And, and people were just going off of what they told them. And they're like, oh, these people are experts. They would know. But it's um, but they didn't know. And, and you know what I mean? So they just like, or they lied, or they lied deliberately. Um, they would say stuff like, there's 1.8 million witches at large in France. And it's just like, that's insane. But um, another myth is that people saw all forms of magic as being equally bad and had a distrust of all magic. And that's not factual either. Um, high magic was often encouraged. High magic is magic that is um, done in the service of a king or a ruler of some kind. Um, it's, you know, the science, they called it a science of alchemy. Uh, the arts included astrology and amirscopy, which is the interpretation of dreams um, or the telling of prophecies, um, usually for predictive benefit, but sometimes for psychological benefit too, sometimes like dream therapy. Uh, and it was all made use of by the learned elite which were all men, because <laughs> women were not allowed to learn, they were not allowed to write, um, <clears throat> they couldn't receive an education. Low magic is what common, uneducated, largely women practiced, using herbs to heal, uh, creating charms or spells, um, handing out um, age-old adages and wisdoms that people would use in their daily lives. Um, and that was the kind of witchcraft that was persecuted most of all, for one thing, because it was difficult for them to mount a defense. For another, because many of these women were older, and many of them were senile. There's a bunch of reasons coming up for why it was women more than men. Um, but there, uh, there, is some, there is some socioeconomic bias. There is some of the fact that these women just couldn't defend themselves. So if a lady couldn't conceive of a child, it was easier to burn a witch than to confront the lady for not providing children to her husband, right? She's been cursed. It was stuff like that, right? Because the way that they treated women was batshit. So that's pretty much the, uh, the extent. Divination was always forbidden, however. Divination was seen as a means of fortune telling. Uh, ever since um, the start of the modern age, divination was uh, considered diabolical, was considered soothsaying or fortune telling, which is, you know, consorting with spirits and demons, and that's not allowed. So you see divination rise in 
the Gaulish witchcraft era that we talked about last time and then get outlawed because people were afraid of it and um, people were afraid of the devil and the cosmic battle anew uh, in, in their daily lives. So that's why. <clears throat> but it was not an irrational fear. People were not afraid as individuals. People were assured that witches were everywhere waiting to steal their babies and bathe in their blood to be youthful. There's a good horror movie about that. Maybe I'll try to think of the name of it. Um, they saw confessions to horrible, horrible things. They saw these women saying that they ate babies or drank babies' blood, saying that they flew through the air. So they had to conclude that something diabolical was going on, even if it was just possessing these women to say these things. But that's because women couldn't read. So they didn't know that there was propaganda going around called the Malayus Maleficarum, teaching all of these investigate uh, inquisitors how to find out if a person is a witch. They didn't necessarily know the extent of the torture or that they were being led to give a similar account, which they were. They only saw them all confessing to similar horrible things. So they were afraid of that, rationally afraid. And the propaganda that went out to the learned elite and the inquisitors was not shared around. That, that was for them. The Meles Maleficarum was published. Um, what year was that? 1489. It's in the timeline, isn't it? 1487. It was published in 1487. So that was when it started to heat up. That was when it's, people were very afraid. Um, there were hysteria of mobs in that time period in, in the early 1500s. It was not uncommon in the smaller villages to see people get worked into a frenzy because someone they know and love is being accused of witchcraft or is what, you know, might be a witch, especially if that person was of ill repute to begin with. Um, so in the larger cities, however, where the judges didn't live near the accused, it was easier for them to remain impartial. So you see fewer um, convictions. You see similar numbers of um, trials or accusations. You see more of them get acquitted. And you see more of them um, be not guilty in the larger cities. And you see less hysteria all around. You don't see people getting hung or being burned at a stake in a large city unless it's a major case. In the smaller villages and farther away from the central court systems uh, where the church really ruled the town, you see people get worked up into a frenzy. Got another good horror movie about that. Tis the season. Okay, so um, it, there, there was an unwavering belief in the power of magic. So naturally, dark magic was not an irrational fear, right? If people could do magic and that was a sure thing, then people doing black magic, dark magic, that's scary, okay? So we also see the shifting political philosophies, mostly Christian political propaganda, but they also were experiencing hardships because the climate was already starting to change back then. And back then they were less change tolerant. They saw population growth, they saw uh, disease, poverty, um, and the most rational fear of all was that those things are being driven by evil spirits and, and that we're heading for the end times and that we're heading for it and people are going to have to be judged and whatnot. So it was not a time of rational fear, but it was a time for sexism. So women were seen to be morally weaker than men, more prone to temptation because of the Garden of Eden and Eve eating the apple. Women were seen to be more lustful, especially when they are widowed or they chose not to marry. Women, they were seen to be, you know, they inclined to gather socially more than men. Um, so that could encourage wickedness <laughs> somehow. Don't have friends. 
<laughs> ladies, if you don't want to be burned at the stake, you better not have any friends. <laughs> Easier to control women in reality. Uh, uh, and they were scapegoats. They were easy scapegoats. Uh, they couldn't read or write or defend themselves many times, so they just got blamed for things, and then that was that. And most women uh, who were convicted were over 50. So the likelihood of getting a confession from a woman went up with age. And back then, 50 was old. So many of them were probably senile. So if women couldn't conceive, then what would stop them from seducing young men with their magic? They can't conceive anymore. They could have all the sex they want without consequences. This is how men perceived of old women. And wise women in villages, they, they could, um, you know, they could heal. They could help people. They could bring rain. They could bring crop and harvest. So they could take it away too, right? So any disaster, any widespread disasters, fires, hail, storm at sea, plagues, um, low newborn survival rates, they were not allowed to question God. They couldn't say, God, why would you do this? It doesn't make sense to me. Help me make sense of this. They weren't allowed to just turn to each other and say that. <laughs> so instead, they, um, instead of committing what would have been blasphemy by doing that, by questioning God, uh, they would blame servants of Satan. They would blame village wise people and say they were consorting with the devil. And that's why. And they were tempted by the devil to blame God. Look at how good they are that they didn't blame God. So that is, that was the, the mindset. Um, and people did fear the rising number of women that were living unattached from men. Um, women have a natural power and wisdom, a natural allure. So um, they do hold power over men many times. And, um, and men back then felt like instead of taking responsibility for that, I guess that it's the women's fault doing that and that's why they could go to hell because women are tempters women are temptuous and it's not their fault that they're tempted and in fact in fact that somehow means that women are the ones more prone to temptation they are temptation stuff like this so very sexist time because um there hasn't been a historical precedent for men to care about their daily actions whether or not they could just sleep around with women. But now, even thinking about doing that is a violation of the commandments, is a violation of service to God. It means you're going to go to hell. So now they have to blame someone that's not themselves for something they've never mastered. And that is why we see the rise in victim-blaming culture. It comes from the early modern age. <clears throat> Okay, so um, eventually the Protestant fear gives way to reason, okay? So we, we see here at the start, the Protestant Reformation is considered to go from uh, 1520 to 1650 CE. That's based around when people are writing and speaking about the subject and writing the masses and all of this stuff. Um, by the time it's over, the world is forever changed. <laughs> um, but the rise of reason, cannot be stopped, and people have realized that torture, it's not about the humanity of it, it's not that torture hurts people, although they did learn that because they started to have physicians oversee the torture sessions and limit uh, the severity and the duration of the torture. And the number of confessions went down <laughs> when they did that. And eventually they realized that it takes a toll on people and that their accounts can't be relied upon if they've been tortured. So torture became outlawed because um, they wanted to know the truth and they didn't think they could learn the truth from someone who's been tortured, which is probably true, which is true, demonstrated by this era of history. But it was not for the humanity, <laughs> which I think is interesting. So uh, torture was restricted and eliminated. Fewer people were confessing. Uh, in 1781, in Spain, the last witch is executed. 
And, uh, and people just didn't believe in witchcraft anymore is really what it was. People just uh, thought that if you believed in witchcraft, you were superstitious and unintelligent and that you couldn't do science or I don't know, whatever. So in this period, the late modern period here, 16 to 1700s, age of reason, the Renaissance and the witch hunt era just went out of fashion. Um, they started to require proof that a natural phenomena could not explain what what people saw before they would go to trial because the trials were expensive um and in that way 80 percent of the trials were acquitted after that because because they could just think of a natural phenomena that could explain it uh skepticism flourished and another reason uh that's a little bit darker is the rise of childhood executions so um children um would often accuse people that they didn't like other kids they would do it in petty ways but um it could start chain reactions and get a bunch of people up on the stand and someone's bound to do something that whips everyone into a hysteria in salem um of only 100,000 people living there 234 were convicted um and 36 were executed um and half of them were in a single hunt and most of them were children. So um, that's a significant amount of the population. And, um, and people really just didn't feel right after that. Uh, they, they, um, they wiped the records clean a few years later um, because they just, they didn't feel right. They, they felt like that was, had been an injustice and that the kids were just kids. And, um, and they white and they immediately banned witch hunts and and um decriminalized witchcraft after that and now salem is salem massachusetts is actually one of the largest uh pagan communities in america or maybe even the world so you know that the rise of child trials and child persecutions is one reason why people couldn't stomach the witch hunt anymore uh the role of torture um the corroborating evidence began to be required. If you named an accused, there needed to be corroborating evidence of them doing something diabolical to put them in the stand uh, themselves. So um, people just, you know, uh, countries went to war. Uh, regimes were changing. Um, the modern world was really forming. Modern language was coming to be and modern culture. And it just, um, people were spending resources up elsewhere. They were more interested in uh, trade, a lot of uh, ocean culture was on the rise and the idea of being a sailor. Pirates were much more feared during this time than witches because they were doing things that were heinous, that were obviously bad. <clears throat> so uh, most people preferred to <laughs> scapegoat pirates by the stage. But that's just, it just fizzled really is the way it ended. So the witch hunt era in summary, I uh, think it's a large scale government operation designed to silence dissenting parties on the basis of religion, as well as to facilitate discrimination against certain groups, largely unmarried or widowed women and homosexual men. Most were not burned at the stake, but hung and then mass cremated. Of the 90 or thousand or so who were tried, about 45,000 were convicted and executed during a 350 year period that spanned all of Europe and part of America. Not 9 million like other authors have read. Uh, and you will see incorrect figures um, like that, where they come from. I'll, show, I'll tell you in a moment where they came from. You'll also see um, the burning times written places. That's a misnomer. Um, it was not worse than the Holocaust. People were not mercilessly slaughtered for no reason. Um, but there, there were tax and government agencies that were irrational or driven by political motives that made use of irrationality to influence people on a, on a large scale. Um, there was some hysteria in smaller villages, but it's really not how it's portrayed at Hollywood. There's no way to know for sure how many of these people were witches, the 45,000 who died. There's no way to know. And it, it's really not as brutal as people think. It's still a time ripe with fear and superstition and irrationality, but and people often did accuse each other for emotional reasons um, or to avoid blaming God. Um, uh, they accused each other under the duress of torture. 
Um, and all the fear did drive witchcraft underground. Um, some traditions may have survived orally from mother to grandmother or granddaughter. Um, it's unlikely that there's any tomes that actually date back this far. Most of the tomes that people have date to like the early 1900s or late 1800s, but they want to say that they're much older. Um, most of the people who would have practiced witchcraft throughout this time would have been illiterate. They would not have been able to write stuff down or they would have been like Cornelius Agrippa, they would have been in the service of kings, like writing about the occult arts before they were called that. <clears throat> and Agrippa was writing in the 1500s, so we're going to come back to him in a second, but he did write during the modern age, and now we're going to go, you know, shift into the postmodern age. Very end of the modern age, the late modern age, we have in the 1800s, the rise of the occult arts. We see, um, that you know, the witch hunt is romanticized, witchcraft as well. Uh, feminism is on the rise in the world. Um, we see people uh, like uh, Susan B. Anthony and um, uh, Gage, what's her name? Uh, Matilda are writing um, and talking and giving speeches about women's rights and the women's suffragette movement is in full swing. Um, people have sympathy for the witches in the past. People became more open-minded uh, with a new capability for understanding. So they came back to witchcraft now believing, well, maybe there is something to witchcraft. Um, maybe I should try to understand what it is they're really doing as opposed to, I don't understand this, so it's Satan. <laughs> it should die. <laughs> Whatever. So... There's someone who is writing at the end of this time period uh, in France called Jules, Jules Michelet, and he uh, romanticized the witch hunt most of all and probably was the most influential. And he wrote about also, um, you know, the balance between women and men uh, and, and uh, the ability of women to be spiritual leaders and to be spiritual, not just witches, but people with spiritual intelligence. And he wrote, La prêtre entrevoit, bien que la paril, l'ennemi la revêté, les redoutable, et dans celle qui fait semblant mépriser la prêtesse de la nature. The priest perceives well that the peril, the enemy, the formidable rival, is in that which he pretends to despise, the priestess of nature. So he put forth the idea that man didn't persecute witches or women, most of them were women, because of their devilry, but because of man's own fear over the female's, the, the inherent power over creation that women possess. Female creative ability was what they feared. And that's why they weren't allowed to learn. And that's why they weren't allowed to leave fear. So this is the first time that you see that idea enter the public consciousness. And it makes major waves. And he wrote it in a fictional story about a woman that it's very romanticized. And you can see Gardner writes about very similar stuff in High Magic's Aid. It sort of makes his own version of that for, the, for the, an even more modern age in English. Because... Um, you're not going to be able to read this unless you can speak French. But that is Michelet, who we will come back to uh, in a moment. Uh, he's relevant once again to the uh, evolution of the occult arts. But this is how he influenced witchcraft and Wicca subsequently by romanticizing the witch and, hum and humanizing her. And then we see the witch cult hypothesis which uh, Murray, Margaret Murray, writes about. So I'm going to come back to the, um, I'm going to come back to the occult time frame between 1500 and 1900 that explains how we get to Wicca in a moment. But for now, let's just focus on the witch cult side of things. Why do people think that Wicca is itself an age-old religion 
Well, because Margaret Murray, who was an Egyptologist, was writing down that people in proto-Celtic Europe were doing modern witchcraft. And that somehow they were organized even throughout the bulk of the medieval and early modern periods, which we definitely know is not factual. But she wrote down that, that it happened and she used the word coven for the first time. And, um, and she talked about initiation. So her witch cult hypothesis, uh, it's pretty much, it's pretty much ball, <laughs> but, um, that there's no sex of witches meeting throughout the medieval ages, but, uh, people did gather in the ancient days in, you know, in proto or pre Celtic Europe. Someone prefers I use that language, whatever, um, back before it was Celtic, <laughs> um, the ancestors of, of the Celts were likely celebrating the changing of the seasons. They were celebrating uh, in a more shamanic way that was uh, less magical. It was less like the depiction of witchcraft we see today with a woman standing in the middle, directing energy. It was more just like a gathering to celebrate the changing seasons. Um, we don't have any idea if they did any kind of ritual or what it would have looked like, but probably not like anything that we do in the modern age is a good guess. <laughs> Um, and Margaret Murray also took the confessions made under torture as being certainly true because they're all uniform. And how could they all be uniform when there was no propaganda? But there was propaganda, so she's wrong about that as well. Um, and she's wrong about a bunch of things. But the ideas that she gave us, she is right about in the future. So <laughs> we, we do have covens and we do initiations. And all of that we all like and adopted and are happy to do. And Gardner learned it from her, believing that it was true of the past. <laughs> so in a way, Margaret Murray gives us that from her transcendent imagination, I guess. <laughs> okay, now let's take a moment and talk about that time period between 1500 and 1900, where we go from um, alchemy and astrology and dream interpretation to hermeticism and the occult arts and even satanism as well so agrippa cornelius agrippa is writing uh the three books of the occult magician or whatever it's called it's in french or frankish um but he is writing about the pentagram the elements, their associations uh, with nature and, and the nature of things to act over time. He very well could have influenced uh, Newton's understanding of gravity and given rise to that psychic physics. He did write about the um, uh, mechanics of action over time first. And so that is interesting that nobody wants to mention that in the scientific field. <laughs> but um, Dual elements of nature is another one that he was exploring, but didn't really espouse much of. Um, mostly for him, it was the nature of things to act and classifying things by the elements. That was in the 1500s. And then Levi comes along. That's not his given name. Uh, Eliphas Levi was not Jewish. He was not born Jewish. He was not converted to Judaism. <laughs> But he did at some point take a Jewish name <laughs> and teach everyone the Kabbalah. <laughs> so I don't know. But he popularized the term occult and also mysteries, like seeking the mysteries. He was the first to work with Baphomet as an androgynous deity, as a combination of masculine and feminine, something that is chaotic as opposed to ordered. Um, he gave us the Hermetic Kabbalah, which is, in my opinion, a bastardization of actual Kabbalah and is not very useful and can actually be dangerous. But, um, but he did give us that. And he also gave us the idea that science and philosophy should be blended. And he got the Rosicrucians from the Christian side and the Freemasons from the science side and architecture and all these various crafts that involve math and physics, and they were very reasonable. They weren't very religious at that time. Well, he got them together, and that's how he formed the Order of the Golden Dawn, which is like the start of Hermeticism, and that's in the early 1800s. 
Then Michelet is writing. Michelet is writing all throughout this in, a, in his own part of the world, romanticizing witchcraft. And, and I don't know if he read what Levi was writing first or if they knew each other or if they both came to it together because the cosmic battle is an actual transcendent truth. I don't know. But he wrote, C'est un certain balancement de deux forces, apposé, symmetrique, mais inégal. L'inférieur fait qu'on ne pas répondre à l'autre. La supérieure s'impatiente et vous la supprimez. à tort. There is a certain balance between two forces. Opposite, symmetrical, but inequal. The inferior force counterbalances in response to the other. The superior force is impatient and wants supremacy and wrongly. So he's the first person to flat out say, not only are there dual forces, but they are equal in one sense and unequal in another, right? Like the worth of the forces is the same, even though they are not equal forces. They do different things in different ways, and that doesn't affect how worthy they are or how valuable they are. So he's the first one to write about that. <laughs> he's also the first to write about the first witch <clears throat> and the romantic take of witchcraft, uh, early duality. So this work came out in 1862. So for better or for worse, uh, the association of this duality as being a feminist notion that has to do with the revitalization of the witches existed because of Michelet. And you can see by comparing the Wiccan read and a lot of Gardner's early writings to Michelet's writings that absolutely Michelet had a huge impact on Gerald Gardner and is probably um, a large reason why the world is so feminist today, honestly. Leland came along, Charles Godfrey Leland, and he wrote about Aradia. He called Aradia the first witch, daughter of Diana, wrote about her initiation. Um, but he, um, well, Leland's gospel is riddled with bias against Christianity and historical inaccuracies. And, um, and he's kind of a fallacious hothead. <laughs> he's kind of fallacious. He's just like, okay, um, if you don't believe what I'm writing, then you're just full of it. You know, <laughs> basically it's just, um, but he did a lot of good things. Like the first associations between womanhood and spiritual leadership that's like written in English text. Um, big part of what paved the way for Wicca. At the same time he wrote this, you see, like I mentioned, Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage fighting for the suffragette movement. Um, Gage, uh, Gage stated her infamous, it's better to be a dead man than a living woman at times. She said that in 1879. Leland's Gospel of Aradia came out in 1899. He was very likely influenced by the feminism of the world. And also a rejection of Christianity that was on the rise because it was just very strict and people were tired of the fire and brimstone uh, preaching. So they uh, went ahead and rebelled against it and just said that uh, you guys were an invading religion and there's a better religion that existed all along that you've been trying to snuff out and we're going to keep that flame alive. We're the daughter of the witches you couldn't burn. So it's on a future slide. That's what people began to believe. You've heard of A.E. Waite, I hope. he ha He's the author of the... Um, tarot card deck that everyone loves, the classic style weight, rider weight deck, that's the weight. Uh, he joined the Order of the Golden Dawn in the 1900s and learned uh, alongside Crowley and Gardner, who joined a little bit later than them and was a lot younger than them. Um, Crowley left just a couple years after Gardner joined and wrote Liber Alvo Vegas, Do What Thou Wilt, Shall Be the Whole of the Law, and that is the foundation of the Order of Thelema, which then became um, the Illuminates of Thanatos and the Levian Satanism. So uh, he started that mentality in 1904. That's around the same time that Anne Rind is writing, I am not my brother's keeper, and the world is tired of feeling responsible for each other and wants a change 
So they are looking for morality that is not based around some objective code. Now, and the Protestants paved the way for this. Okay, the Protestants paved the way for this when they said that it's up to any individual to get into heaven or hell. And now people are saying, well, not only is it up to the individual to get in heaven or hell, but it's also up to me if there is a heaven or a hell. And that was also fueled by Descartes, uh, who is a big philosopher around this time period. He's writing about, I think, therefore I am, and uh, subjective morality, and what it means to define your own reality. So we see uh, an ability for looking at oneself as the master of one's reality, as the master of one's decisions, as the master of one's fate, are all ideas that can enter the greater <laughs> consciousness of humanity at this time. So many consider Crowley to be the, um, the father of modern Satanism. <laughs> many would call LeVay that role. But, um, but both of them are very influential. Now Gardner, he started with the Golden Dawn, but he branched off. He liked Murray's writings. So he's very feminist for the time. <laughs> so he wanted to do something else. And he took a bunch of Rosicrucians, um, like uh, Sabine. Um, what's her name again? Um, Rosamund Sabine. Uh, is one of the witches who probably founded the New Forest Coven in the 1930s, which is probably one of the first covens ever founded. And she was an ex rosicrucian who did the Golden Dawn for a bit, who left with Gardner to form a coven, though Gardner claims that he was abducted by that coven and initiated um, in like a mysterious ceremony, but there's no actual evidence of that. So it's likely that he like started the coven and then just like told people that. Um, as a way to like increase the hype for like what an initiation means and what it means to be in a coven because a lot of people were like coming to adopt this uh, this same um, philosophy and the same mentality but they um, he didn't he wanted the authority over what it means to be Wiccan to rest with him so Gardner was the first one to include the witch cult hypothesis into hermeticism and um, and they and they started to and it, it became a very feminist movement where they started to feel like the witches, the daughters of the witches, they couldn't burn. And there was this notion of like um, of um, what's it called inheriting your traditions, right? So the rise of lineage witchcraft and the idea that um, you might have wisdom or knowledge about magic or the occult arts that came from your heritage that was passed down from a mother or grandmother. Usually it was a woman because again, it was really sexist. So even though probably 20,000 men were killed for witchcraft and they have reason, plenty of reason to believe that men were witches because of the Druids and the remnants of that and the Cathas, they, they still just, for some reason in the modern age, the end of the modern age into the postmodern age just equated witchcraft with womanhood and then felt like men were reclaiming the title of witch, even though witch, even though witch wasn't even a term until they started using it. I don't know, but people are a little bit crazy and that's why they believe crazy things and that's fine. But Gardner, okay, so Gardner was the first to publish like a Wiccan manual. He published High Magic's Eight. He published a fictional account of a witch doing the rituals that are in his book of shadows like it's really just a manual on how to do magic that pretends to be fiction and it's not written very well like it, it's it's got a compelling story it's well worth reading if you want to understand the foundation of witchcraft very well and where it comes from in the historical context i would read it i enjoyed it i thought it was good but a lot of people say it's dry and hard to read um gardner published that in 1949 and is just popularizing witchcraft and magic. Gardner blended the ceremonial magic from Levi and the knowledge of the occult arts from Agrippa. And he blended that with the romantic notion of medieval witchcraft um, from Michelet and 
his phrasing of the original read is very reminiscent of how Michelet said it. It's almost a direct translation from the French. Um, he also blended in the witch cult hypothesis and the ideas of covens and initiations from Margaret Murray and her notion of fertility as well, saying these were ancient fertility practices. These people wanted uh, the crop they wanted. And she was probably right about that part of it, right? So it was difficult for people to know when someone was wrong, when they were right part of the time, especially back then, when they had lower standards of research and, um, and less ability to fact check with the internet. So that's where Wicca comes from. So High Magic Sage was basically a manual presented as fiction because it was illegal to write about witchcraft at the time. And uh, when Wicca became legal in the next few years, uh, because Winston Churchill was a big fan of the occult, I think that's what happened. Um, but so uh, in the early um, 1950s, Gardner's publishing um, nonfiction, and Witchcraft Today is one of these first publications, and it's the first one to use the term Wicca on print with one C, though. However, that term was also being used simultaneously with different spellings, largely witche, with two C's and an E, pronounced witche, by Charles Cardell, who also claimed to be a lineage witch, like Gardner had claimed um, that, and, and Rosamund Sabine claimed that she was a lineage witch as well, uh, and a few did. But um, Charles Car Cardell started his own coven, the Coven of Athel, and it was a lot different. It was less hermetic, it was less ceremonial. It was more nature worship and wisdoms of the earth. Um, and that was eventually merged back into Gardnerianism. So in the early days of Gardnerianism, it was very hermetic. And then in the later days, it became more like the Wicca we know today. Um, Raven Howard is who took over his coven. He passed it to Eleanor Bone. Years later, she merged it back into Gardnerianism because they all got old and died eventually. <laughs> so they had to pass it to other people who then, you know, did their own thing. But um, Gardner founded the Brickett Wood Coven when Cardell was still active. Uh, after he was in the New Forest Coven with Rosamund Sabine, he hived to form the Brickett Wood Coven. Uh, so there was so there was his coven and Sabine's and Cardell's. Doreen Valiant joined um, Gardner's coven for a time in the early 1950s. And Valiant was the writer. And, and Gardner just loved her and just thought she had so much potential and doted on her. That's, a, that's what I've read. So, um, you know, she got very active and rewrote all of his teachings and, and basically wrote the Gardnerian Book of Shadows we know today and the Wiccan Read. And Gardner was gaining a lot of popularity. He was talking about Wicca and a lot of the press that we, they were getting, a lot of, a lot of the um, publicity was negative. People did not like witchcraft still, like they didn't trust witches. Um, so um, a Valiant uh, recommended they propose some rules that would you know, basically limit the public discourse and his exposure to the public of their beliefs and, and all this. Um, but Gardner replied to her saying that there already were rules and the rules were basically just things he definitely came up with on the fly to like limit her um, power as a high priestess. So she just was fed up with him after that because he wouldn't listen to her about the publicity and she didn't want to do that anymore. So she left uh, in 1957, which was a major divide for the Wiccan community and, and Wicca as a religion may not have survived this, um, if not for Doreen Valley and subsequent work uh, in later years to, to get people writing and, and get people, you know, disseminating the ideas and not just hoarding them amongst themselves. Um, so she tried Cardell's Cult of Atho, but she ultimately decided to be a solitary witch. So when, D when Doreen Valiant uttered the witch's read, in her 1964 speech, and then again in her subsequent book, Witchcraft for Tomorrow. This is the mother of modern witchcraft. When she was giving those wisdoms to the world, was a solitary witch. She, she was a solitary witch for most of her life. Uh, she was only in a coven for uh, nine years, I think, eight years total. 
and she was a solitary witch the rest of her life. Uh, she did make amends with Gardner before his passing in 1964, but she never tried to rejoin that coven or form her own coven. She just did her own thing after that. So she's amazing. So then Wicca spread to the world. Wicca spread to the masses on the wings of the free love movement uh, as the eagle soars. And political activism and solitary practice and the support of solitary practice and the fact that it was an open tradition that anyone could practice in their own way um, is what allowed Wicca to become so popular and so mainstream. Um, a few people who are classic authors, you know, Alexander, uh, Alex Sanders, rather, um, in Alexandrian Wicca, and his students, the Farrars. Um, Sanders is not really an author. He gave a couple of speeches, but he really uh, was very hermetic and very big on the ceremony, and he just didn't care that much about disseminating what he knew. But his students, the Farrars, were egged on to share it by Doreen Valiant, as well as Raymond Buckland, who was a part of the Bricketwood Coven um, after Valiant had left it and uh, after it was being run by somebody else and Gardner was, about, was pretty much passing away, Buckland joined. And he left and wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to move to America, but there were no covens there. So Doreen Valiant encouraged him to start his own tradition of Wicca, and that became Sayax Wicca, which is British traditional Wicca. It's very like Gardnerianism. It's um, a little heavier on the fertility and a little less heavy on the hermetic practice and the ceremonial nature of the rites. And it also has elected leadership. So you become a first, second whatever degree, and then every year they elect who is the high priestess of the coven for that year, even if everyone is technically a second degree, only one of them holds the title and they elect for it. So that's very American. So that's interesting. Um, but yeah, so that's why we call Valiant the mother of modern witchcraft. Not only did she give us the read, but she also just encouraged all of these people um, to write and continue to share um, their vision uh, and their practices with the world. And she realized at some point that there's no going back and that the free love movement carried Wicca into the world. There's no stopping it. So she figured that if people are going to practice magic anyway, <laughs> they may as well do it safely and do it well. Uh, and that's when she started writing in earnest as well. Um, and then Alex Sanders was very successful in Alexandrian Wicca. And his sect spread like wildfire in England as a result of the free love movement. So he quickly became known as a witch king, uh, which we'll talk more about titles and things next time. But that's someone who uh, has 13 organizations that have hived off of theirs. And um, yeah, Valiant just nourished his students, the Ferrars and Buckland. Uh, and just was a motherly figure to everyone when there wasn't really one for them because a lot of the covens were still being led by men or they weren't very successful. Like, I guess they didn't have ambitions or they didn't try to grow, so they didn't make as much of a mark, uh, probably is what happened. Um, but Valiant, as a solitary witch, was just there and just corresponded with all of them so much. <laughs> and got them all to write so many books and wrote so many books herself. Um, how to just the intuitive nature of magic and how to be a witch in your own way. Um, and she believed in openness and inclusivity, working to build a better Wiccan philosophy. And, um, and yeah, Valiant is really the reason why Wicca is not considered another hermetic art. It's not an occult art. It's a religion because of her love and her guidance for all of the various people who were involved in its creation. These are all people, at the end of every chapter, there's further reading. So if you're going to want to really master this, I suggest you go back and look at the questions and do some of the further readings and read some of the books, the classic authors. That's the, class, the classic authors, that's what we call them, because they were writing during the foundation of Wicca. And we're going to talk about post-classical authors here. So. Um, We'll talk about, you know, um, Scott Cunningham, right? So even before, you know, so Buckland, when Buckland started writing about the merits of solitary practice, and Doreen Valiant had long been a solitary witch, and now she's authoring. So suddenly everyone's like, oh, you can be a solitary witch. Okay, maybe that's okay. And then you see people like Raven Gramasi start the Iridian tradition and 
uh, revitalize Italian striceria. And you see Scott Cunningham, who joined Gramassi's Coven, leave and then go and do his own thing and become just one of the most successful solitary witches ever, you know, in, in the world. Um, so uh, Starhawk was writing as well. She's a post-classical author. She's creating Reclaiming Wicca. She had a hand in creating Dianic Wicca. Um, and she was just writing about women's rights and adoption of the LGBTQ plus into Wicca, which we're going to talk about next time a little bit more in depth, postmodern topics um, and what it means to like be feminist in a modern world and whatever. But yeah, I mean, even from the beginning, oh yeah, Starhawk is the reason why we can um, ministrate with the United Life Church, why you can become a leader and then use the United Life Church to become a minister who can marry people legally and that sort of thing. So her activism work led to inclusion of Wicca as an official religion by the US government and various organizations, which is huge. She's amazing. So a lot of people are writing about solitary practice or starting your own covens or being true to yourself, right? And that's where we see Wicca entering the postmodern age and where we're gonna pick up next time. But yeah, so even from the beginning, Wicca was constantly in flux. It was constantly being um, influenced and written about uh, by many different people with many competing philosophies uh, and just shaped by many hands into the structure it is today. <laughs> so that is postmodern. That's where we are. And next time we'll cover a few more topics and then we're done with this course series. I hope you're all getting ready to initiate if you're planning to for Samhain. And this time it's chapter eight, the rest of the chapter. Um, it's kind of a lot of reading, it's a lot of dates and stuff. There's questions, there's some exercises, but again, none of this should be necessary to initiating. So um, if you're down to the wire and you're like, do I focus on this or do I focus on being ready to initiate? Focus on that because Sawin is coming. And that's it for today. So thank you all for watching this heavier, more difficult historical <laughs> lecture. And from all of us here at the Coven of the Open Mind, bless you.